Was it good or was it bad? You're going to find out everything you need to know about this super interesting novelty. Fabiano Caruana busted out with the Black Pieces versus Ding Lee Ren in round three at the candidates. And I don't even want to foreshadow anything more about this game because so far to date right now, it's my favorite battle that has ensued from Russia. And I can't wait to share my analysis and all the things I learned about this game with you. Let's go. So we had a semi-slav. Now, not a... Uh, Super big surprise at the high levels. This is a variation that players tend to play with both sides in their repertoire. But going in for the exchange variation, this is the sharpest stuff that black can really strive for. And it's always indicative that someone has spent some time in the kitchen with their sous chefs working on some home cooked meals. Now, after a4, this is the typical idea you always go for to stop the move b5. You don't want it to be too easy for black to hold on to their extra pawn in these lines. After bishop f5, knight e5, e6 and then f3 this is the standard idea we're trying to make sure we get the center and hold on to it considering the fact that this pawn will likely fall to either the bishop or knight it always seems like a good idea for white to emphasize central control before rushing to get the pawn back however after the move bishop to b4 we are in one of the most topical variations historically for the semi-slav. Now, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the variation that was being played most commonly was the move e4. Uh, this line leads to a super dynamic piece sacrifice where there are tons of games in the database. I'm not going to go into it besides to say that uh, it's almost been worked out to the point where it's considered a forced draw uh, at the high levels. And so you just you just don't see it very much uh, for white or for black, honestly, but especially as white looking for more out of the first stage of things. So Ding Li Ren now plays the move knight takes c4. This is uh, the, the topical way people have started to play this stuff. And after castles, we get the fun variation that uh, that brings us to, to just... The, all the excitement we had in this game. I'm looking at my analysis here as, as we talk about it because there is a lot to it. Uh, the idea here from Ding Li Ren was the move king to f2. Now, it seems like a move that's breaking principles clearly, right? You're moving the king here uh, rather than just developing your pieces. But the point is that you desperately want to get e4. However, as we've seen, playing e4 is going to walk right into this piece sacrifice that we already talked about. The compensation black has here is very strong. Black might even be better uh, in a lot of key lines. So king of two, just from the perspective that it threatens e4 because the knight on c3 is no longer pinned, makes a lot of sense. Furthermore, the fact that if you get the big center and you can keep the king here, you've actually accelerated your development to a degree because the rooks will be connected very early and often. The drawback of playing a move like king f2 this early is pretty obvious, right? You're putting the king in the center, especially on dark squares, and uh, you're, you're kind of asking for it if your opponent has the guts to bring it. And that's exactly what Fabiano had here. He played the move e5. Now, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. I worked hard on, on reviewing this game. Grandmaster Day on Boykov for our official chess.com news reports. You can read it. Also contributed to my analysis here. Th there's a lot here, and I definitely encourage you to go check that out if you are a stronger player watching this video and really curious about what the real word is about e5 was it good was it bad i'm here to tell you i think fabiano's preparation was spot on it was fantastic and it wasn't until the later middle games that this move ended up looking like it was a mistake really i think computer preparation and vichy Anand's comments on our live broadcast were really uh hitting hitting it uh hitting the spot right on as far as where fabi let this game slip so e5 what's the idea well the king is in the center Obviously, if the pawn takes on, on e5, well, now you've opened up the, uh, the, the dark square diagonal, and, and you're probably going to regret it greatly. Uh, the main point is that after the knight takes, we see an idea that's been played uh, commonly in these kind of variations whenever there's a king on f2. Bishop to c2 by Caruana. The idea is that if you take c2, the queen can take d4 check. You've regained your pawn. Uh, you're going to grab the piece back on e5, and you're going to have long-term compensation against the king on f2. But queen to d2 is the move. This is the uh, the common response to this tactic here with bishop to c2. And after c5, we see ding go for the move d5. It makes total sense when your king is in the center. You're trying to keep the position closed. Makes little to no sense to even consider taking a pawn like this when the bishop will take with check. And then again, the, uh, the attack is going to continue to rage. So d5 seems perfect. At this point, ding li ren was already the person starting to use time on the clock, not Fabiano Caruana. Bishop to b3, you're threatening to win your pawn back. So white naturally plays e4 to hold on to the center. Rook to e8 tempos the knight. And after the queen defends it, we see the interesting idea c4. 
uh, this move opens up the c5 square for the bishop, right? The bishop has sort of served its purpose on e4, or sorry, b4, in the sense that it would prevent it e4 for as long as it did, right? The whole reason we put the bishop on b4 to begin with was to open up those sacrifice ideas, make it hard for white to get a big center. Now that white has gotten that big center, the bishop no longer serves a purpose. Time to relocate it makes total sense. After the move, knight takes c4. We see knight b to d7. Bishop to e3, trying to guard that diagonal. Now the move, knight to f8 is played. The fact that Fabiano played this move very quickly, and I said this in my analysis, really just, again, speaks to the, the work his team does. I, I would say that for my money, and I don't have a lot of it, but if I was a betting man, I'd say that the most well-prepared player on the planet these days happens to be Fabiano Caruana, and his team does a great job. You don't, you don't launch down two pawns in a position where intuitively you think you need to do everything to play aggressive chess against a king. You don't launch a remaneuvering of a knight uh, and do so so quickly unless you know exactly what's what's ahead in this line. So at this point, I was watching the game along with many other fans and thinking that, wow, what, what does Carwana have in store here? He's down two pawns and they are pretty. They are pretty, but there must be some sort of long-term compensation. You start to look at the position and you realize this queen is, is borderline kind of trapped over here, right? The knight coming to g6 is a very strong idea, especially if this queen doesn't have a safe square to retreat to. Combine that with the fact that even though you're down two pawns, white still has not completed development. So if all of our pieces come into the center, maybe there's more ways to open lines, right? You start considering how can we sacrifice to open up opportunities for our rooks on these potentially open files. And you just know that white was not out of the woods at all here. So, in the game, bishop to d4 was played. A lot of people thought the idea here was very clear, to try to retreat the queen to this diagonal. But after the move knight to g6 from Caruana, Ding actually kept the queen on the king's side that he should have gone on to regret. I'm going to show you the critical moment here in a second. It's understandable, though, why Ding didn't want to bring the queen back to c1. Uh, variations we analyzed here start with queen to c1, and after rook to c8, knight to d2. The key point is that black can now do what I was foreshadowing you would try to do to take advantage of lack of development, blow things open. Knight takes e4 check, followed by bishop takes d5, is based on some pretty key tactics. You've already won two pawns for the piece, the king is wide open, and you can't take on d5 without queen h4 check, double attack, winning back the bishop, and launching an unstoppable mating net. So, this idea is probably what uh, Ding was a little bit worried about, uh, meaning this knight takes e4 plan, but it, it is a little bit tricky. White could also consider taking with the knight. There are ways that you might want to go for this and say, yes, I understand you've got two pawns here, but I don't have to take and allow queen h4. I can play moves like bishop e3 and stay safe. Uh, there's also g3 to consider. This position is an absolute mess. The main thing I think we're taking away is that Clearly, e5 by Caruana's team was very well prepared, and black does have a lot of pressure, if at least practical in nature. Was it really enough against best play? I think queen to c1 might have been a key, a key way for white to test it. But after queen f5, still seems okay for white. If you give the computers, the evaluation seems to think, no, white's still up a couple pawns here. But here's the problem. Bishop takes c4, played by Fabiano. Bishop takes c4, and now the move queen to c7. The point here is that you're gaining a tempo on the bishop, but more importantly, it's actually a double attack of the c5 square. If the bishop, let's say this bishop moves to somewhere random. If this dark square bishop falls apart, the roads open up everywhere into white's king over here. Furthermore, the queen herself might immediately get involved in, in, in a dangerous attack. So queen to c7 and the idea of now playing bishop to c5 was still played relatively quickly from Fabiano. Uh, it, it was said earlier and noted that maybe knight to g6 was the first move that threw him off because it was the first time he kind of slowed down. But rook to c8, analyzed as more accurate by a lot of people that looked at it, I think is, is actually uh, maybe a little overstated because after knight e3, knight g6, while you are forcing my queen to stay on this side of the board, it's not exactly clear how you take advantage of her. So there's more analysis over at the blog. Uh, stronger, more advanced players can go check it out and see if you believe me or not. But I think, I think if Ding had played queen c1, this was the real test. But after queen f5 and we get this variation, as I said, where bishop c5 comes, it was this position right here that really turned the tables for Caruana. If you want to pause the video, you can. I highlighted one of the reasons why we're trying to get rid of that dark square bishop. But black has to find a key intermezzo, intermezzo, I tend to mispronounce that word, I've been told, uh, in this position that, that allows the entire game to start slipping. So the move Caruana should have played was the move rook to e5 x clamp. A little bit of a, uh, a queen tempi in the middle of recapturing your bishop goes a long way here. 
The point is, after the queen moves, we gain yet another tempi. And after the queen moves again, we now gain another tempi. To the point where, if the queen continues to move and black now regains the bishop with check, the attack is actually super, super strong, very dangerous, just to give you give you some quick examples. King moves, we bring the queen into e3, there's threats of knight d3, the position is falling apart. So much so that probably the analysis my team worked on here says that queen takes f4 might actually be the best option at this point, and after takes, you save the bishop. Uh, this position is actually still pretty unclear. I, I'm not sure that black is... Uh, going to be better with the with the extra queen white has a ton of material for it right you're looking at a rook two bishops here uh sorry two bishops and two pawns total for the queen um and you know would would this type of dynamic be enough for long-term compensation when the dark squares are still very hard now for black to deal with it's possible right these are the kind of positions where you want to play moves like knight d7 you don't even want to defend your rook you want to hope that white is dumb enough to part with the dark square bishop to let you in on the squares just to give some practical advice of how you would play such a position the points are less important than the actual ability to make threats but but that that position um still probably not ideal for white given that you had to give up the queen and go and uh, go for something very unbalanced so this move rook e5 uh was really the key opportunity that fabiano missed when he took on c5 and now follows it with another mistake that world champion Vishianon was very critical of and kind of said to him, this was a signal that things had finally gone awry as far as this novelty gambit idea of E5, H6. Now, Vishy's comments on the live show were actually really interesting, just the psychological nature of preparation, meaning you're in a position here where you have to be kind of all in. Your compensation is going to be temporary at best because the moment white has time for things like G3, King G2, get the rooks connected, get the king to safety, you're going to see things start to dwindle. Too many minor pieces have been exchanged to make, a, make room for a slow move like h6. Fabiano knows all this stuff, but the point is if he had to play it, then clearly something has gone wrong, and uh, he knows he might have missed his, his opportunity to capitalize on his team's preparation. So, after h6, rook d1 was played. By the way, what was the better move besides h6? Shouldn't be a big surprise. Again, rook e5 was key. It's not as strong as it would have been before, however. After queen h3, the point is white is kind of inchworming her way back to safety. If you play knight f4, the queen can go to g3. Again, I'm hitting the knight. I'm threatening to come to f2. If you take, I'll take with the knight. And you're already looking at a position where you can just feel the, the, the air being taken out of black sails, right? Too many pieces are being traded without enough concrete deliverables changing against the white king. So, rook e5 was still the best. Uh, the main line we gave, both Dayan Boykov and I actually analyzed the same variation separately. Not too hard to imagine. We both have computers helping us, so it uh, doesn't make us genius. Great minds do think alike, though. Uh, queen to b4 hits, hits b2 would have been the best for black, keeping white a little off balance. Rook to b1, knight f4, and after queen g3, the move knight 6 h5, followed by the key point f5. That's why we brought that knight from f6 out of the way there. This was probably black's, black's best path forward. Um, white is still much better. I think already you're looking at ways to give up at least one of the pawns back and try to coordinate uh, your king, but, but this definitely keeps the pressure on and is much much more indicative of what the position needs. You have to be aggressive and forward moving than the move h6 that Fabiano played. So after h6, rook d1 played by ding. And after queen to b6, rook d2 defending. Queen to e3, rook c2. These are these are moves that are that are not your favorite to play as black because the air is kind of being taken out of your sails, right? Uh, you're making one move tempi moves, not, uh, not moves that overall improve your attacking chances like rook e5 and moving the knight to try to open up new lines with f5 and the f file, right? So you can, again, you can kind of see the position slipping for black. a6, queen to h3. Speaking of open, opening new lines, b5 is a good idea. White would never want to take here and let the rook get involved. And so Ding goes for the plan I already mentioned. That's very hard to stop. Queen g3, followed by queen f2, g3, king g2, and very slowly, Bob's your uncle. I'm going to eliminate all your attacking chances. And uh, those watching the game at this point could start to see the evaluation was going up for white, and it didn't look like it was going to be coming back down. b4, knight d1, queen b3. Again, I call these kind of one-move tempi threats. b4, I move the knight. Queen b3, I move the rook, right? Where's the beef? You're running out of time. Queen takes a4. You've gotten back one pawn, but that's not going to be nearly enough. So after queen f2, queen d7, g3, we get the move queen h3, a5. Makes sense. Trying to use a two-on-one advantage while you can. But after queen to d4, uh, white is in, in fantastic shape. This is a great move. Threatens knight f2 to kick the queen out, which we will finally reach our goal of king g2, getting the rooks coordinated, and it just looking uglier and uglier for black. Because of that, 
you can see uh, Fabi's plan, as critical as you might be of it, that this, this does ultimately lead to, to nothing, uh, the peace sacrifice you're about to see. From a practical point of view, if the alternative was to bring your knight back to f6 because it's being attacked, allowing bishop f3, king g2, and rook over, this position feels even more lost for black with e5 coming and d6 uh, than even what happened in the game. So in the game, Fabiano sacrifices the knight, leaving some of us, uh, some of us pundits who, you know, at this point we don't have, still have a lot of time to have looked at it with the computer. Makes people think, all right, was this still part of preparation? The king is open here. There's still some threats, still some unbalanced stuff for white. But hindsight is 2020, and, and looking at it, you can see that this was purely a desperation sacrifice, and Caruana had nothing. King f1 played, queen d6, rook g1. Ding starts using both sides of the board very, very well here. He doesn't need to develop or castle in the classical sense anymore. Bishop b5, very nice, gaining a tempo. You're also going to be anchoring your, uh, your big center. b3 slows down what was maybe black's outside chance of a two-on-one. Rook f8, rook c2, very good moves here. Knight e6 played, but it's just a trick, right? Making sure Fabiano's paying attention to basic tactics. Knight g5, h4, knight f7. Now I really like this move, rook c6 and queen c5. The, uh, the pressure is on. At this point, you had Wesley So, uh, Grandmaster Wesley So, an Olympiad teammate of Fabiano, calling for Fabiano's resignation in the live chess.com chat. Uh, rook takes f6 is great. Rook e6 is also good. Um, obviously, black can't take it because you hit the knight and then go to fork town on e7 here. But I think why not grab a pawn when it's there for free? You save the rook on f5. At this point, it's clearly over Red Rover, making some moves quickly to get get to the last things. Wesley's still really having fun. If you follow us on social media here, he was saying, oh, look out, the B-pawn's going to queen. Push him, baby. Push the B-pawn. Uh, but really, it was all fun and games. And Wesley, uh, not meaning, to, I don't think, to poke fun at Fabiano, but he was saying that it was time to resign for a while, uh, which leads us to an interesting daily question. I think we'll come back to talking about it in our next uh, show after the uh, rest day, which is, is there an appropriate time for Super Grandmasters to resign against other Super GMs? Leave a comment here in the YouTube video and see if you agree. Um, White is up a piece and and with the attacking compensation at this point, so not much to go over besides eventually Rook B3 was played. And uh, amazing to see both both Geary and Caruana lose going down in, in, uh, in flames in home-prepared lines, right? That just doesn't happen that often. We actually had some comments um, from Ding Lee Ren to kind of back up uh, what, uh, what I was telling you in terms of how he felt about the preparation. I'm just going to bring it up here and, and read it for you because... Our team works so hard to watch all possible news outlets. And, and he said that, you know, Fabiano played so quickly. He, I was down more than an hour. He was sure that this, this sacrifice may be good for Black. Um, and that really, in, from Ding's perspective, Fabiano's position was actually still going very well uh, until he played the move H6. So uh, the move that uh, was criticized by Vichy Anand. And even though I said, I think, I think actually rookie five here is really the move that shows the preparation in a deep level, which is why I didn't think knight g6 was really a mistake earlier. Um, you know, I, I, th I think the position was still full of compensation for black, but right here, not playing rookie five and then not playing h6 uh, would have been, would have been uh, the key points for Caruana as Ding Li Ren shared himself. So uh, a fantastic win, right, for the Grandmaster from China, who started out 0-2. He was the only one putting up a donut to the score. If you watch my videos previously, I even kind of said, is he already going to be on tilt, right? You don't want to go 0-3. You, usually you stop the bleeding at the high levels with a half a point with a draw. But Ding goes big here and gets a huge win. And uh, speaking of going big, let's show you guys what our full... Uh, CAPS, which is our computer aggregated precision score, a fancy way of saying accuracy, our system, which you, of course, can run games through over at chess.com. Uh, by far, Fabiano's least accurate game. I think all, both the other two games, he was over 98%, so this was not his best chess. Um, H6 really being the key blunder that sends that game arc in the direction of white winning. Yes, white was above before that, according to the computers, but a lot of that is the material, and as you saw from my analysis, um, I actually believe that uh, that Again, if, if the moves were played differently, as far as rookie five, if we talk about that, like right here, I still think the preparation was actually uh, spot on and very, very dangerous stuff from Team Caruana. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Please check out one of the other two videos I've already done as far as game of the day analysis for the candidates. Click on those. They're right in front of you. Don't go anywhere else. We will see you after the rest day with more candidates coverage over on chess.com TV. And uh, hope to see you in chat then.